World Spaceflight News Special Report. The first launch of SLS, Artemis 1, has 10 CubeSats manifested. 13 were originally selected, but three satellites were not ready in time to be included on this flight, Lunar Flashlight, Earth Escape Explorer, and Cislunar Explorer. The 10 now waiting for launch are, Lunar Ice Cube, Team Miles, NEA Scout, CUSP, Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper, Lunar, BioSentinel, Omatanashi, Equilius, and Argo Moon. The payloads are integrated into commercial off-the-shelf COTS dispensers and integrated into the SLS Block 1 vehicle. Leveraging launches for the Artemis program to deploy rideshare smallsats to deep space provides a low-cost opportunity to perform missions that previously would have required a larger spacecraft and a dedicated launch, and offers additional benefits to both NASA and the smallsat community. CubeSats, including those manifested on the Artemis 1 flight, have a valuable role to play in the Artemis program, providing data to address NASA's Identified Strategic Knowledge Gaps SKGs, in its plans to permanently establish humanity in deep space. Payload sponsors and developers for the Artemis CubeSats hail from a variety of NASA industry partners and mission directorates, as well as international space agencies and universities. Several payloads destined for cislunar space will demonstrate propulsion systems and other technologies useful to future exploration. Science missions manifested on the Artemis 1 flight include characterizing the effects of deep space radiation on living organisms, searching for hydrogen and other volatiles on the Moon's south pole, and studying the lunar radiation environment. Some of the payloads were selected through NASA's Centennial Challenges program. Those payloads are competing for prize money while meeting specific technical development goals, such as communication with Earth from millions of miles in space. Student involvement in almost half of the Artemis 1 payload development allows STEM engagement with SLS and NASA's Artemis program. In addition to launching Orion and large volume missions, CubeSats may also be a part of Artemis missions to deep space. After Orion separates from the core stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage ICPS, which includes the Orion stage adapter where the secondary payloads are located, prepares for its disposal maneuver. Its last act is to send a discrete signal to activate the secondary payload's deployment system SPDS sequencer and start the countdown to deployment of the secondary payloads. The secondary payloads are scheduled for deployment at a series of trajectory locations known as bus stops. Uh, yes, we have uh, 10 CubeSats on this flight. Um, uh, we talked at the flight readiness review today. Five of those have been essentially topped off in terms of battery state of charge. Um, we've had open communications with each of the uh, CubeSat customers as to uh, access and, and just design constraints all the way up through uh, the uh, install on the vehicle. Uh, prior to that, we had uh, the payload safety review process and, and uh, we are um, at the point where we're getting ready to fly. Uh, the remainder of those CubeSats, uh, we, based on analysis, believe have sufficient charge to conduct a mission. Uh, some may actually uh, need to uh, recharge uh, after they're deployed, uh, after they gain some uh, solar, um, solar power uh, through their solar arrays, uh, but we believe each of these has a mission. That said, the CubeSats are uh, relatively low cost. Uh, they, t they have relatively uh, low levels of redundancy and a relatively high failure rate. So we do anticipate one or more of these CubeSats um, to not be successful in its mission uh, just due to the nature of the, of the CubeSats themselves. Argo Moon, developed by Italian company Argitec and sponsored by Agenzia Spaziale Italiana ASI, Italy's national space agency, will perform autonomous visual-based proximity operations around the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage ICPS, the upper stage of the SLS rocket, that provides the propulsion to send Orion on a lunar trajectory. The CubeSat will use high-definition cameras and advanced imaging software to record images of the ICPS and later of the Earth and the Moon for historical documentation, provide mission data on the deployment of other CubeSats, and test optical communication capabilities between the CubeSat and Earth. 
ArgoMoon will use a hybrid micropropulsion system, MIPS, that combines green monopropellant and cold gas propulsion in a single system to provide attitude control and orbital maneuvering using a small amount of power. The enhanced attitude capabilities are also used to run and validate artificial intelligence-based algorithms for autonomous failure detection, isolation and recovery systems that perform continuous monitoring of the health of the satellite to detect any potential fault. In the case of fault detection, this service performs several operations to solve the problem. If the fault is not recoverable, the satellite goes in safe mode, which means that only the functionalities to keep the satellite alive and to communicate with ground are used. ArcoMoon's mission is a forerunner of technologies for deep space application that can be used for inspection of satellites not originally designed to be serviced, without the involvement of the ground segment. BioSentinel will be the first long-duration biology experiment to take place in deep space and will be among the first studies of the biological response to space radiation outside low Earth orbit in nearly 50 years. Its primary objective is to measure the impact of space radiation on living organisms, in this case, yeast, over long durations beyond low Earth orbit. Developed by NASA's Ames Research Center in California's Silicon Valley, BioSentinel will enter an orbit around the Sun via a lunar flyby. The experiment will use yeast as a living radiation detector to evaluate the effects of ambient space radiation on biology. Human cells and yeast cells have many similar biological mechanisms, including DNA damage and repair. The payload carries dry yeast cells stored in microfluidic cards, custom hardware that allows for the controlled flow of extremely small volumes of liquids that will activate and sustain the yeast. These yeast-filled cards are situated alongside a physical radiation detection instrument, developed at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, that measures and characterizes the radiation environment. Results from the physical instrument will be compared to the payload's biological response. After completing a lunar flyby and spacecraft checkout, the yeast will be rehydrated at various points during the six-month mission. As yeast cells activate in space, they will sense and respond to the radiation damage. Experiments using the BioSentinel instruments will also take place on the International Space Station and on the ground to demonstrate how varied amounts of radiation affect the yeast. While earthbound research has helped identify some of the potential effects of space radiation on living organisms, no terrestrial source can fully simulate the unique radiation environment of deep space. BioSentinel's data will provide critical insight on the effects of deep space radiation on biology as NASA seeks to establish long-term human exploration of the Moon under Artemis and prepare us for human exploration on Mars. BioSentinel's microfluidics card, designed at NASA Ames, will be used to study the impact of interplanetary space radiation on yeast. Dry yeast cells are stored in microfluidic cards inside a 6-unit, or 6U, CubeSat spacecraft that weighs about 30 pounds. The spacecraft will be deployed from the second stage of the launch vehicle to a lunar flyby trajectory, from which it will enter an Earth-like heliocentric orbit. After completing the lunar flyby and spacecraft checkout, the science mission phase begins with the rehydration of the first set of two yeast-containing microfluidic cards. Each card has 16 wells, eight containing the wild-type strain and 8 containing the radiation-sensitized strain RAD51 Delta. Each set of fluidic cards is expected to be in its active mode for up to a week following rehydration. Sets of cards will be activated at different time points over the 6-12 to 12 month mission. One reserve set of cards will be activated in the occurrence of a solar particle event SPE, a powerful radiation storm that poses a significant risk to astronauts on long-duration deep space missions. Payload science data will be stored onboard the spacecraft and downlinked to Earth via telemetry. Growth and metabolic activity of the yeast cells will be measured using a three-color LED detection system and the metabolic indicator dye Alamar Blue. Biological measurements will be compared to radiation data provided by an onboard physical sensor and dosimeter, and LET spectrometer, to obtain total ionizing radiation dose and particle characterization and to Earth-based experiments using relevant energetic particle types, energies, and doses. Additionally, two identical BioSentinel payloads will be developed, one for the International Space Station, which will be in similar microgravity conditions but a comparatively low radiation environment, 
and one for use as a delayed synchronous ground control at Earth gravity and Earth surface level radiation. Thus, the BioSentinel payload will help calibrate the biological effects of radiation in deep space to analogous measurements conducted on Earth and on the ISS. The BioSentinel mission is funded by the Advanced Exploration Systems Program within the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Partner organizations include NASA Ames Research Center for the Development of BioSentinel and NASA Johnson Space Center for the LET Spectrometer. The project manager is Matthew Napoli at Ames, and the lead scientist is Sergio Santa Maria. Antonio Rico is the lead technologist. At NASA headquarters, Andreas Martinez is the Advanced Exploration Systems Program Executive. Just a bit bigger than a box of cereal, one of the first CubeSats to travel in interplanetary space will be NASA's miniature space science station, dedicated to studying the dynamic particles and magnetic fields that stream from the Sun. The CubeSat to study solar particles, or CUSP, will hitch a ride out of Earth orbit aboard the first flight of NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS. Once the CubeSat is ejected, it will orbit around the Sun in interplanetary space, measuring incoming radiation that can create a wide variety of effects on Earth, from interfering with radio communications to tripping up satellite electronics to creating electric currents in power grids. CUSP will be able to observe events in space hours before they reach Earth, said Mihir Desai, the principal investigator for CUSP at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Such interplanetary observations would give us significant insight into what drives space weather, helping scientists to improve their simulations. CUSP is a six-unit CubeSat, meaning it has a total volume of about six liters. This microsatellite will carry three instruments, and the observations from those instruments will give us an unprecedented look at our interplanetary space environment, which is driven by the Sun. The Sun releases a constantly flowing stream of particles and magnetic fields, known as the solar wind. Interspersed are faster, denser clouds of solar wind material, known as coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. When these CMEs, or even a particularly fast stream of solar wind, reach Earth, they can interact with Earth's magnetic field, creating what's called a geomagnetic storm. It is the buffeting of the magnetic fields and the release of energy that can stress power grids and impact space technology. To understand these effects on Earth, Scientists want to track how the space environment changes and develops between the Sun and Earth. Currently, measurements of the space environment come from a dozen or so satellites, all carrying different sets of instruments. Most of these satellites are in one of two basic orbits, circling either Earth or the L1 Lagrange point, a point between Earth and the Sun about a million miles from us. Right now, it's like we're trying to understand weather for the entire Pacific Ocean with just a handful of weather stations, said Eric Christian, lead Goddard scientist for CUSP. We need to collect data from more locations. To create a network of space weather stations would require many instruments scattered throughout space millions of miles apart. But the cost of putting together such a system built out of full-fledged satellite missions is prohibitive. CubeSats like CUSP might be able to help solve the problem. Though the satellites can only carry a few instruments apiece, 
They're relatively inexpensive to launch because of their small mass and standardized design. So, CUSP also serves as a test for creating a network of space science stations. If you had, say, 20 CubeSats in different orbits, you could really start to understand the space environment in three dimensions, said Christian. The three instruments that CUSP carries will each provide a different contribution. The superthermal ion spectrograph is built by the Southwest Research Institute to detect and characterize low-energy solar energetic particles. NASA Goddard's Miniaturized Electron and Proton Telescope, or MERIT, will return counts of high-energy solar energetic particles. Finally, the Vector Helium Magnetometer, or VHM, being built by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, will measure the strength and direction of magnetic fields. CUSP was born of opportunity. Originally CUSPP, with two Ps, standing for CubeSat to study solar particles over the poles, it was slated to fly in low Earth orbit, studying solar particles near Earth's poles. But when the call went out for CubeSats to fly on SLS, the team realized they had an opportunity to do some serious interplanetary space weather research for a fraction of the usual cost. With only a relatively small amount of additional funding to reconfigure the satellite and instruments, the team won a spot on SLS for a ride to interplanetary space. Equilius, developed jointly by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and the University of Tokyo, will travel to Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 2, an Earth-Moon orbit where the gravitational pull of the Earth and Moon equal the force required for a small object to move with them. The CubeSat will demonstrate trajectory control techniques within the Sun-Earth-Moon region and image Earth's plasmosphere, a region of the atmosphere containing electrons and highly ionized particles that rotate with the planet. The name stands for Equilibrium Lunar Earth.6 U spacecraft. Skywatchers will also notice that it is the name of a small constellation of faint stars listed by Ptolemy. The name is Latin for Little Horse. Equilius will measure the distribution of the plasmosphere, providing important insight for protecting humans and electronics from radiation damage during long space journeys. The CubeSat will also measure meteor impact flashes and the dust environment around the Moon, providing additional important information for human exploration. Equilius will be powered by two deployable solar arrays and batteries, propelled by a warm gas propulsion system with water as the propellant. Equilius will be released to begin a lunar flyby sequence over a period of one to three months, followed by maneuvers exploiting Earth-Sun-Moon dynamics over five months. This will bring it to a libration orbit around the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point using a minimal amount of propellant. It will make observations from this position for about one month before the mission ends. The Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper, known as Luna HMAP, was developed by Arizona State University and sponsored by NASA's Science Mission Directorate, SMD. It will measure the distribution and amount of hydrogen throughout the Moon's South Pole. If successful, the Luna HMAP spacecraft will produce a high-resolution map of the Moon's bulk water deposits, unveiling new details about the spatial and depth distribution of potential ice previously identified during a variety of missions. Confirming and mapping these deposits in detail will help NASA understand how the water got there, how much water might be available, and how it could potentially serve as a resource for longer exploration missions on the Moon. The CubeSat's mission is designed to last around 60 days, consisting of 141 science orbits. Its primary science objective is to use a miniaturized neutron spectrometer to count epithermal neutrons and map water abundance in the South Polar permanently shadowed regions from low altitude, 8 to 25 kilometers, at resolution better than 20 square kilometers. After it is deployed from the Space Launch System it will use lunar flybys and its ion propulsion to enter lunar orbit, then will shape the orbit to achieve its nominal 4.76-hour elliptical polar orbit with an apple-yoon altitude of 3,150 km and a paraloon of 8 to 25 km. Communication and downlink will take place every 3 to 5 days. The mission is scheduled to last a minimum of two months making neutron measurements. At end of mission, when the propellant runs out, it will be targeted for a lunar impact. Planetary geologist Craig Hardgrove, Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration postdoctoral research associate, proposed the mission and will be overseeing it as principal investigator. 
Luna HMAP will be designed, built and tested on ASU's Tempe campus, in partnership with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and several other partners supplying space-qualified hardware and services. As Luna HMAP flies over the lunar south pole at a very low altitude, it counts the energies of neutrons that have leaked out of the lunar surface. The energy distribution of the neutrons that hit the detectors tells us about the amount of hydrogen that's buried in the top meter of lunar soil. The Lunar Ice Cube mission, led by Moorhead State University in Kentucky, will study water distribution and interaction on the Moon. The mission carries a NASA instrument called Broadband Infrared Compact High Resolution Exploration Spectrometer Birches, to investigate the distribution of water and other organic volatiles. Lunar Ice Cube will help pave the way for human missions through significantly less expensive robotic missions and by addressing water dynamics on the Moon, said Mark Lupicella, Exploration Research and Development Manager. The Birches instrument will not only help map the distribution and dynamics of water on the Moon's surface, but also in the exosphere, a very thin atmosphere-like volume surrounding the Moon. Scientists are interested in understanding the absorption and release of water from the Moon's regolith, which is comparable to soil on Earth's surface. By studying the absorption and release of water, scientists can start to map changes occurring on the Moon. Finding and understanding water on the lunar surface is vital to establishing a sustained presence on the Moon. Lunar Ice Cube plans to have a seven-hour elliptical orbit around the Moon, where it will observe the lunar surface for an hour of that time. This limited observational time is due to Birch's view of the Moon. If the Sun peeks into the Lunar Ice Cube's point of view while it is observing or traveling to the Moon, the Birch's instrument would be permanently damaged due to the intensity of the Sun's energy on the infrared detector and other sensitive optical components within the instrument. To prevent this, the team developed a small garage-like door on the instrument that will open and close to protect the instrument. In addition to the miniaturized technology for the Birch's instrument, Lunar Ice Cube will feature a Busek Bit 3 Ion Propulsion Thruster, a new technology for CubeSats. Other pioneering commercial off the shelf systems include an instrument cryocooler and 120 watt solar array. The Birch's payload is roughly the size of an 8 inch tissue box. The team had to drastically miniaturize legacy hardware from a previous NASA mission to one sixth of its original size. Lunar Ice Cube is a collaborative effort between NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, NASA's Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Center in Fairmont, West Virginia, Moorhead State University, MSU, and commercial partners, including the Busek Space Propulsion Company. The mission principal investigator is Dr. Pamela Clark of JPL. Lunar Infrared Imaging, formerly known as Skyfire, is a 6U CubeSat designed to perform a lunar flyby followed by a deep space technology test to address questions related to transit and long-duration missions. The primary objectives of the mission are to address strategic knowledge gaps SKGs, for surface characterization, remote sensing, and site selection observations for the Moon, and SKGs for long-duration missions to Mars. The primary mission goal is to collect data that will enable future risk reduction for crewed missions. It was developed by Lockheed Martin Space in Denver, Colorado, and sponsored by NASA's Advanced Exploration Systems Division under the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Tyvek International, a division of Terran Orbital, built the spacecraft bus, while Lockheed developed the sensor and its cryocooler. Ground Network Communications Station support is provided by Kongsberg Satellite Services through its 13-meter dishes. The stations are in Chile, Norway, and the Troll Station in Antarctica. The CubeSat will conduct a lunar flyby and use an advanced miniature infrared sensor to gather images and data about the lunar surface and its environment. This effort will help collect data to address knowledge gaps related to transit and long-duration exploration to Mars and beyond. The CubeSat will collect data about the lunar surface, including material composition, thermal signatures, presence of water, and potential landing sites. Its infrared sensor will be able to map the moon during both day and night and can collect data at much higher temperatures than similar sensors, thanks to an innovative microcryocooler, similar to a refrigerator, designed to reach cryogenic temperatures below minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit. 
After deployment, it will perform a lunar flyby, taking images of the surface to characterize the moon's thermal environment. After the flyby, it will conduct technology demonstrations related to maneuvering and deep space operations related to future Mars missions. Through its investigation of the lunar environment and advanced operational techniques, this powerful CubeSat will provide key pieces of data advancing the state-of-the-art technologies and increasing operational confidence at deep space destinations. The Near-Earth Asteroid Scout, or NIA Scout, will be the first CubeSat to travel to an asteroid. It will be America's first interplanetary mission using solar sail propulsion. Using photons from the Sun, the spacecraft will be propelled using its solar sail to fly by a near-Earth asteroid, 2020 GE, upon which it will use a high-quality 20-megapixel array optical science camera to image the target and address key strategic knowledge gaps. These asteroids are of interest not only for human exploration, but also for science, in-situ resource utilization, and planetary defense. The small payload was developed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville and the agency's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. NIA Scout will be propelled by a square-shaped solar sail that will measure about 925 square feet when unfurled. The sail is made of an aluminum-coated plastic film that is thinner than a human hair, with an area about the size of a racquetball court. NIA Scout is outfitted with a high-powered camera that will take photographs of and collect data from a near-Earth asteroid that represents asteroids that may one day become destinations for human exploration. Observations will include the asteroid's position in space, its shape, rotational properties, spectral class, and geological characteristics. NIA Scout's mission will take approximately two years. The NIA Scout spacecraft is housed in a 6U CubeSat form factor. It will be different from all previously flown solar sail systems. Its objective is to use the sail for controlled flight to effect a close flyby of the target asteroid. Given that the solar sail is a single sheet deployed on four booms from the center two units of the three-axis controlled spacecraft, any asymmetries between the center of pressure CP, of the sail with the spacecraft system center of mass CM, will result in a torque on the system that must be carefully managed to maintain attitude and thrust control. To manage the CP to CM offset and other solar pressure-induced torques, NIA Scout will use an active mass translation AMT, device, reaction wheels, and incremental changes in velocity provided by an onboard cold gas thruster system. The technologies developed for NIA Scout, including the boom geometry, sail membrane, deployment system AMT, and algorithms for managing the sail's momentum and attitude are being transitioned into a much larger and more capable sail system for the planned NASA Solar Cruiser mission, planned to fly later this decade. The suite of onboard science processing commands developed for NIA Scout enables high-resolution imagers to capture large amounts of data and prioritize the most important aspects for downlink during bandwidth-constrained mission scenarios. This is accomplished through a collection of downsampling, cropping, and compression routines, which can be used together to significantly reduce the volume of data which is sent to Earth while not sacrificing resolution. Once a target region is identified, cropping can be commanded as either a specified region of the image or around the brightest object in the image. This produces high-resolution cutouts around the target and relevant stars, which can be downlinked for a fraction of the bandwidth allocation when compared with the complete image. The onboard target detection technique allows trajectory verification and refinement, the detection of targets of opportunity, automated target tracking and target survey and classification in future missions. During the development of this unique spacecraft at Marshall, a special fixture called Dreadnought was created. Dreadnought was designed to support integration and test of NIA Scout after a failed fit check with the flight dispenser. It supports a CubeSat safely, while providing maximum visual and physical access in and out of the dispenser simulator. The CubeSat can be translated horizontally into the desired position, dispenser, or fixture in a slow, controlled manner. Dreadnought also affords control while maneuvering the CubeSat into a vertical position. This support is necessary for CubeSats that are sensitive to bending, as was the case for NIA Scout. The elevated table provides full access to the upper CubeSat surface and room to fully open upper and lower 3U long solar panel wings. For NIA Scout, 
Dreadnought allowed custom fitting of the upper and lower solar panels into the dispenser, necessary due to out-of-plane condition of flight solar panels. When in the simulator, fit of the panels was easily observable and access was available for measuring clearances. This allowed correlation to the dynamic analysis models for better prediction of behavior in vibration testing. NIA Scout will demonstrate the feasibility of using a low-cost, solar sail-propelled CubeSat on an asteroid reconnaissance mission. It will be a pathfinder for many potential missions using sail technology in the future. Onboard data analysis enables new mission profiles, which are not possible with traditional methods for analyzing science return. Altogether, the NIA Scout mission will be a pathfinder for a capability that can benefit a variety of future missions, big and small. OMA Tanashi stands for Outstanding Moon Exploration Technologies Demonstrated by Nano Semi Hard Impactor. It was developed by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, with the University of Tokyo. While OMA Tanashi is one of several Artemis 1 secondary payloads that are studying the Moon, it is the only one that will conduct a controlled landing on the Moon's surface. Its primary objective is to test the technologies and trajectory maneuvers that allow a small lander to land on the moon while keeping its systems, including power, communication, and propulsion systems, intact. Testing these systems around and on the moon can help with development of similar small landers that could explore other planets. The spacecraft will also measure the radiation environment beyond low Earth orbit, providing data that will help develop technologies to manage radiation exposure for human exploration. If successful, Oma Tanashi will be the smallest spacecraft ever to land on the lunar surface and will mark Japan as the fourth nation to successfully land on the moon. Oma Tanashi is a 6U CubeSat, 10 by 20 by 30 centimeters, with a mass of approximately 14 kilograms. It comprises a small surface probe, a retromotor module, and an orbit module. The surface probe has an inflatable airbag and shock absorption system comprising crushable material and an epoxy filling, designed to allow survival in surface impacts at target speeds of 50 meters per second vertical and 100 meters per second horizontal, corresponding to a few hundred meters of lunar freefall. It has a P-band transponder for communications and an 18-watt-hour lithium battery for power. The retromotor module contains a 500 newton solid rocket motor capable of about 2,500 meters per second deceleration and forms the core of the CubeSat. The orbit module guides the spacecraft trajectory. It also carries a radiation monitor. Spacecraft attitude is maintained with 425 millinewton axial thrusters using our 236 FA propellant. The total mass of propellant is 0.74 kilograms stored in a 589 milliliter tank. Fine control is achieved by three reaction wheels. Positional knowledge is via star tracker, for sun sensors, and a three-axis IMU. Spacecraft power is provided by body-mounted solar cells and batteries. Attitude control is via cold gas jets mounted on either side of the solid rocket motor. Mission profile, after separation from the SLS, Omotanashi will make a single maneuver, a lunar impact orbit, combining lunar orbit insertion and descent. The CubeSat then spins up and the airbag is inflated. At the end of the descent phase, the orbit module is jettisoned and the solid rocket motor is fired, bringing the spacecraft almost to a vertical standstill at an altitude of 100 to 200 meters. The surface probe is then released and makes a free fall to the lunar surface, impacting at a shallow angle at roughly 30 meters per second vertical velocity and under 100 meters per second horizontal. The airbags and shock absorption mechanism are designed to ensure a survivable landing. Following the semi-hard landing, the project hopes that the craft lives for six minutes or more to radio back landing data.
For Team Miles and their CubeSat entry in NASA's CubeQuest Challenge, it's about propelling citizen science to the moon and beyond. Their breadbox size Miles spacecraft is a 6U satellite built to navigate into deep space. Wesley Failer heads the group of citizen scientists and engineers that initially came together through Tampa Hackerspace in Florida, all participants in the community, nonprofit workshop. Since Hackerspace, Failer adds that the team now has experts in software development, communications, radiation, as well as project management. The entire Miles mission will be flown autonomously by a sophisticated onboard computer system and propelled by evolutionary plasma thrusters. Miles Space, in partnership with Fluid and Reason, LLC, is making use of a Model H ion thruster design for CubeSat propulsion. Failer is the inventor of the patent pending Constant Q plasma thruster, drawing upon over a decade of research in ion and plasma thrusters. We're a team of makers, not specialists. The social contract is that people will join as long as they get to try everything, says Failer. It's a very organic structure, he adds guiding the team through a decisive yet collaborative and considerate manner. Along with plasma thrusters, the team's CubeSat features other advanced technologies, such as a software-defined radio. Still, we have to prove that our technology is probably going to work. But for us these brand new ideas freeze the mind, it has for me and it did for my team, Failer contends. The independent feedback from NASA has been incredibly valuable, whether you win, place, or show. Using the thruster in communication technologies, and spacecraft success in thrusting to the minimum of 4 million kilometers required for the deep space prizes, Team Miles is eyeing going farther than this size of craft has ever gone, traveling to a planned 96 million kilometers before ending the mission. Partnerships with other commercial industries have led to the formation of Miles Space, a commercial endeavor to further develop the technology and intellectual property that has come out of the design process. The CubeQuest competition offers a total of $5 million to teams that meet the challenge objectives of designing, building and delivering flight-qualified, small satellites capable of advanced operations near and beyond the moon. The competition is sponsored by NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate and managed by the Centennial Challenges Program at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. We're building satellite. We developed a 6U CubeSat. For NASA CubeQuest. That's going into deep space. We're children of the maker movement. We actually form because of the challenge. It's become a business. We're trying to win the farthest communication distance prize. So we're gonna actually ride the SLS. They're dropping us off past the moon. We get kicked out, solar panels pop open. We're actually flying some new technology. We've invented a form of ionic plasma propulsion. We're using a very minute amount of fuel to achieve a huge amount of thrust. It's pretty revolutionary. And we're having to develop technology just to allow for the communications that we need. All the panels face up and twirls. So we're developing a line of satellite dishes that are small and portable to track a moving satellite as it comes across the horizon. That we can actually prove to NASA that we were able to communicate that data back to Earth successfully. We've got passion, we've got drive, a lot of brilliant people all across the country working together to make this happen.